Well, good morning. Good morning and welcome to First Baptist Oakers. Our welcome and call to worship is going to come from John chapter 13. John chapter 13 will begin reading in verse 31. So John 13, 31. And as you are, are turning there, uh, a couple of announcements. Uh, today, uh, we are continuing to take up our Annie Armstrong Easter offering. And we'll have a video about uh, the work that, that the North American Missions Board is, is doing. And uh, I got to see firsthand the, the, the work that the North American Missions Board is doing this past week when I got to go out to Georgia, go to the, the, the Missions Board offices and go through some training and everything. And uh, again, I think our, our giving and our offerings that we take up are being used very well. And uh, so just like it's being used very well for the International Missions Board, so is it being used for the North American Missions Board. So. Thank you for praying for us as I was gone, and, and Megan made it through <laughs> with me being gone. That's not a shock by any means. Uh, also, as I was there this last week, one of the topics that we talked about was prayer. And as the, as the pastor was up talking about prayer, I thought how uh, I have dropped the ball this last year when it came to COVID and us stopping our, our prayer meetings. And so I'd like to start that up again. But we're going to do it at a different time. So starting this Wednesday at 6.30 here in the sanctuary, from 6 to 6.30, we're going to be start having our, our Wednesday, having a Wednesday night prayer group. So what we're going to do, uh, I, I remember the, the pastor said, oftentimes our prayer requests are more often about keeping our 90-year-olds out of heaven than our teenagers praying them into heaven. And so that's going to be the focus. Yes, I mean, if you have prayer requests about... Uh, health needs or your, your aunt's uh, ankle is sprained or something like that. We can pray for that. But I want us to pray specifically for our church and our community and, uh, and, and us to be a light in this, a, a light and a witness in this community. So that's going to be uh, starting this Wednesday night at, at, at 6.30. Also, we're continuing our 40 days of prayer emphasis. And today, the theme is loving one another. And how fitting that is in the world in which we live. Uh, that we are called to love each other, and that's why we're reading from John chapter 13, verse 31. God's Word says, When He had gone out, Jesus said to them, Now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in Him. If God is glorified in Him, God will also glorify Him in Himself and glorify Him at once. Little children, yet a little while I am with you, you will seek me, and just as I said to the Jews, so now I also say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you are also to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. Let's pray. Father, we come before you now, God, and we thank you for this day that you've blessed us with. This day to come here to, to be reminded of the love you have shown us through sending your Son, your only Son, Jesus Christ, to come live a perfect life and die on the cross and rise from the dead. Lord, we thank you for your love for us, for providing salvation for us through Christ alone. Lord, I pray that the love that you have for us would transform our lives. So that we would then, in turn, continue to love and serve each other. And that we would love and serve this community in which you have placed us. Lord, we thank you and praise you for the life that we have because of Jesus Christ. It's in his name I pray. Amen. Amen. Would you please stand and join us in singing. <clears throat>
all of this story coming together and just have God written all over it. Nampa First Southern Baptist Church was, was planted in the 50s. Some faithful folks were here saying we, we want to have a, a gospel-centered presence here. So this neighborhood you know, kind of grew up around the church. And then the city grew beyond and, and the church had to either adjust or not adjust to the changing environment around them. And so the folks that were left were the ones saying, how do you preach a resurrected Christ with a dying church? We heard about it, the plight of this church, and we packed it all up, me, my wife, my four kids, and, and headed for Idaho. Replanting takes the idea of, of church planting and puts it inside the, the housing of, of existing resources. We're planting not brand new in a brand new setting, but we're building upon the legacy of what was here. And so for us, um, preparing for a launch was a chance to kind of reintroduce ourselves to the community. We, we wanted to take full advantage of that. So it was flyers downtown, and it was mailers to the community, and it was getting out here to say this new church right here in this old context. And so, um, you know, when, when we launched in February of 2017, imagine a church that has been, you know, 30, 35 people maybe on a Sunday to have 130 people show up in your sanctuary. I mean, those of us who've been here through that process are looking around like, where did these people come from? So... Does it matter that this church is still here and hasn't been given up on? Yeah, it does, because the watching community now knows, yes, Jesus is alive, because he can even resurrect a church from the edge of, of really closing its doors. So that's what we've been able to do because of the Andy Armstrong Easter offering. It's a gospel story baked into the story of this church and in, in our lives. say too much about replanting, but that's an exciting process that they've just started at the North American Missions Board, and if you want to hear more stories about it, I'll talk to you about it, because I went through some of that, so that's exciting. Well, I am pleased to uh, introduce to you Pastor George. Pastor George uh, served as pastor at River Park Bible Church down in Fresno. I know we have some, some uh, former members of River Park Bible here today uh, who are, 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 are here, and you serve faithfully under his ministry. I tell you what, I really uh, look up to pastors who have served in the same church for decades. Uh, those men who have done that, uh, are, are, they are my heroes uh, to serve in the same community, same church for decades, uh, years of faithfulness. And uh, Pastor George is now uh, serving with the Legacy Coalition, and he's here to talk about discipleship, in particular, discipling the next two generations. And so I think this is something that's going to be really helpful for all of us. And so with that, I'd like to introduce to you Pastor George. And he's going to come up, and he's going to preach, and he's also going to share about the ministry that God has called him to now. Thank you, Pastor Gray. It is a great privilege... Uh, yeah, why don't you hand that to me? Great privilege to be with you this morning. Uh, this is my wife, Linda, uh, of 46 years. And as we talk about grandparenting, I want to be on the record to say she is the champion of the grandparenting in our home. She's an amazing, amazing grandmother. Um, uh, also, I want to introduce a couple that's helping me this morning with materials and resources because we want to do everything we can to give you uh, a chance to, especially if you're a grandparent, to just have resources to be more effective and to be more involved in the lives of your grandchildren. Uh, David and Terry Paget uh, are that couple, and uh, they will be at the back table following the time. Uh, I said to Pastor Greg when I walked in, I says, you look like the most dysfunctional church I've ever seen with your chair set up back to back from each other. That you don't, and it's just funny to say, you know, that's obviously a way to control the crowd. But what a great idea when you have little ones, you put them in front of you and you can watch what's going on and, and keep control of them. So that's kind of fun. Um, so uh, it's been fun as well over the years from a distance years back uh, as uh, we got to watch. Uh, Pastor Greg and, uh, and uh, Megan finalized everything can become married and then be up here. And I prayed for you for several years in your ministry here. And it's been a joy to pray for your church and to pray for several churches. And this was one of them on my radar. 
because uh, we have that connection with Pastor Greg and Megan. And so um, our subject today will be reaching the next generations for Christ. Uh, now, if you have children at home, everything I say applies to you today. But at the same time, I have a special target of grandparents this morning. So, but don't be thinking, no, uh, this is not for me. As a matter of fact, even if you're not even married yet, this is for you. Because it's one of the things that has not been taught in the church as it should have been taught. And uh, that's one of the reasons I'm excited uh, about this uh, new ministry. Uh, Lynn and I have become passionate about the things that we are going to talk about. And there are 12 reasons why. And the 12 reasons are our 12 grandchildren. Uh, we are long distance grandparents. We have three uh, grown children married. And each of them have given us four grandkids, uh, one in Los Angeles, one in the Dallas, Texas area, and one in Raleigh, North Carolina. And I often say about that, that's not right for them to be so far from us. But that is why we need to be even more intentional, more involved in their lives with the distance that we have. Um, we're going to be starting with some things and so I want you to be turned to Deuteronomy chapter 6 Deuteronomy chapter 6 and I want to start with two questions two questions before we look at this passage the first question is for parents parents do you know what the Bible says about being a Christian parent? And that is why I have given you this statement in your notes, and it might be helpful for you to follow along with those notes. And one of the ways it's neat about notes, it's kind of like your watch. You know, he's nearing the end when you see the end of the notes being filled up. But the statement is this. The most important thing you need to know as a Christian grandparent is what the Bible says. Now, if you've grown up in the church, you're familiar with Deuteronomy 6. It is the most important passage for parents. Now, if you were asked what the Bible says about the role of the responsibility of a parent, hopefully you would say, I got it. I know that as in God's eyes, I am the primary disciple maker. Parents are the primary disciple makers. And one of the things that's a, 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 a false perception, and really of the, of the devil, and that is to even think that parents, I will raise my kids, give them rules and regulations. Church, pastors, you take the spiritual side of things. That's wrong. That's an inaccurate recognition of what God has said. So in Deuteronomy 6, and just for a second I want to touch on this, Deuteronomy 6 is known in, in the Hebrew as the Shema. Shema. The word, the Hebrew word Shema means here. Here. And it's the Lord's way of saying, listen. Don't miss this. This is key. Deuteronomy 6, 4. Hear, that is Shema, there it is. Hear, O Israel. The Lord is our God. The Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And teach them diligently to your children. There it is. Talk of them when you sit in your house. I'll skip a little bit. Walk by the way. Tell them about it when you lie down and when you rise up. Now, in my years as a senior pastor, uh, I did a fair share of sermons on parenting. Uh, I talked about the role of leadership in the home, talked about marriage, and 
Deuteronomy 6 was the go-to passage as a pastor. But something happened that I missed. Because this is what leads us to the second question. And the second question is this. And this now is to grandparents. Grandparents. Do you know what the Bible says about being a Christian grandparent? Now listen, six years ago, after all my years of being a senior pastor, a teacher, I could not answer that question. That's why I've given you the second statement. The most important thing that you need to know as a Christian grandparent is what the Bible says. Now, I went to Bible college. I went to seminary. But I couldn't answer that question. A very interesting thing. So let me be honest with you. And by the way, that's usually a good thing for a pastor to be. <laughs> be honest with you. I miss this. I miss this. Now, before I discovered what the Bible said, I considered myself a good grandfather. I, I love my grandkids. I love to spoil them, I love to tease them, I love to joke with them, I love to tell them corny stories and, and corny jokes, and I love having them at my house. And I thought that defined me as a wonderful grandfather. And then five years ago, Linda and I went to a, a conference, a children's pastors conference in Southern California for the reason and the purpose of interviewing a children's leader, possible someone who could take over our children's ministry. And we did not go there for the conference speakers. We went there to be able to make contact with these people that might be potential staff members. And as we looked through the program, the last breakout session, <clears throat> the last breakout session was on biblical grandparenting. <clears throat> And of course, that struck a chord with us that made us interested. And we said, let's go to this breakout session. Now, this conference had probably over a thousand people at it, but in the classroom that we went to, there were nine of us. And the man who spoke was a man by the name of Larry Fowler. Larry Fowler is the founder uh, and the leader of the Legacy Coalition. And what he did is he said, I want to tell you what I missed for years. Now, he had been with Awana for something like 40 years. As a matter of fact, I think this region early in his ministry was one of the places that he had oversight with the Awana program. But he opened up the word and he said, I missed this. And because I missed this and now understand it, I want to make it my mission to get this out to the world, out to the church. And he explained what biblical grandparenting was all about. And sitting in that room, he made, a, he made a statement. He says, we are looking for a thousand churches in the United States that will get in their DNA what biblical grandparenting is all about. And I raised my hand and I said, you only need 999. We're in because I saw how crucial this was, and especially having missed it and add to that, wanting to reach my own grandchildren for the Lord. So, he took us, however, to the passage that I want you to be blazoned in your mind, okay? It is Deuteronomy 4, 9. Now, I remember in Bible school, I remember in seminary, we would often ask the teacher, the professor, Am I responsible for this on a test? <laughs> As to the reference I just gave you, the answer is yes. You are responsible to remember this text, the passage text. And by the way, here's the way to remember it. My football team is the 49ers. 4-9. So what's the passage you to memorize? Deuteronomy 4 Nine. 
Here is what it says. Only give heed to yourself. And keep your soul diligently. So that you do not forget the things which your eyes have seen. And they do not depart from your heart all the days of your life. But make them known to your sons and to your grandsons. Now, we're going to examine this verse a little more fully in just a few minutes. But I want to take you to a word. Uh, there is a word in this text that I missed. And I want to point out to you uh, this word nestled in the phrase, make them known to your children and grandchildren. Now, it does not take a Bible degree or a seminary degree to get this key word. And pastors love, and frankly, one of our joys is to be able to say, here are key words in Scripture need to understand. Agape, love, pisto, faith. And then, but here's a word that I missed. And you may not have gotten it, so let me give you the key word. And that word is and. A-N-D. And. Do you see that? Now watch this. Those most responsible for the souls of children are parents. Second most important in the role of reaching children is grandparents. Not pastors, not youth leaders, not Sunday school teachers, not Awana leaders, not coaches, not teachers. It is parents first, grandparents second. Make them known to your children and your grandchildren. And that is why I say again, the most important thing that you need to know as a Christian grandparent is what the Bible says. Now, I'm going to borrow some points uh, from Larry Fowler, uh, who again is our leader with Legacy Coalition. And, and he use some points that are very helpful to us understand and summarize the role of grandparents. Deuteronomy 4, 9 begins with a statement, only give heed to yourself and keep your soul diligently. Let's stop right there. Give heed to yourself. And, and what Moses does in Deuteronomy 3 is he speaks of three generations. Now, we're going to be talking about four, but in Deuteronomy 4, 9, he speaks of three generations. And he starts with a generation that I want you to understand very clearly. And he begins with this, and here's the statement in your notes. The person in your generation, we're talking about the first generation, the person in your generation to be most concerned about is you. It's you. Give heed to yourself. You want to have a lasting, a lasting effect upon your grandkids. You want to pass your faith on the generation. It starts with you being concerned about your walk with the Lord. That you are committed to Him. That you love Him with all your heart. So what is needed for faith to be passed on, it is parents and grandparents, parents and grandparents making known the things of God to their children and their grandchildren. Now, how do you know how your soul is doing? Well, let me give you a simple little thing that you can look at. It's in 3 John, turn there if you would, 3 John, verse 4. One way to examine your soul to see if it is being kept diligently is to hold it up to the light of 3 John 4. John says, I have no greater joy than this, to hear of my 
children walking in the truth. You see that? Now, the, the people that John is speaking of are not his biological children. Uh, they are the ones that he has led to Christ. Uh, and yet I have no problem saying this should be really the greatest joy of a parent and a grandparent is to see their grandchildren walking in truth. But I want to take you just a moment here. And it's interesting as John says walking in the truth. Now watch this. He doesn't point them to the children's profession of faith. He takes them to the evidence of their faith. And the evidence of their faith is walking in the truth. You see that? Now, he could say, I rejoiced when you made a profession of faith and you were baptized. But he says, my great joy is to hear you walking in the truth, the evidence of your salvation. <clears throat> now, without a doubt, the moment that anyone came to Christ was a day of celebration. How many of you had a day of celebration when family members that came to Christ and you hear about this? That's just one of the greatest things. But John points out, the fact that there's the walking in truth is the evidence then that really shows what's important. But here's the point in this. And here's the question. What in your children, if you're a parent, the children at home, or if you're a grandparent, parent, what in your grandchildren gives you the greatest joy? You know what I have found over the years? is that Christian grandparents shift away from spiritual things to say that's mom and dad's duty. So I will simply be focused on their accomplishments and how good they do in school or if they're musical or athletic or whatever. But you see, one of the best tests to find out if you're keeping your own soul diligently is, is your great joy. The condition of your children and grandchildren's soul, that is, when they walk in the truth. Because if that is not your greatest joy, it really points back to you. Isn't Christ supposed to be your greatest joy? Isn't he to be your greatest treasure? You see, when Christ is your greatest treasure, you want that for your family. And so, the big question is, do you tell your grandkids, do you tell your children, parents, listen, my greatest joy is you walking in the truth, and or pointing that to them, to say to them, I can't wait, and I want you to know this, what I look forward to most for you is the day you come to salvation, and the days that follow that prove that you're truly Christ. But you see, no parent can truly say, I have no greater joy than to hear that my grandchildren are walking in the truth, and thus they themselves are walking in the truth. My friends, if you do not value your own soul, it is not likely you will value the souls of your descendants. And so, as a grandparent, I know it is easy to talk about everything out of the sun. And again, six years ago, five years ago, I could talk to my grandkids about all kinds of fun things. But we need to talk to our grandkids about the things of the Lord. Things regarding the soul. And so, 3 John 4 is a helpful, helpful motivator to action. And I have actually turned 3 John 4 into a life statement to my grandkids. And one of the things I have said to them and continue to say to them is that my, my greatest joy is seeing you walk in the truth. I love seeing you do well in other things too, whether it be sports, music, or academics. But far greater joy is knowing that you love the Lord with all your heart. And then I've added, if you're not walking in truth, it will be my greatest sadness. And I will always love you. And I will pray, I will pray diligently that you come to know Christ. But stating something is so important. 
Now think for a moment, John says, I have no greater joy to see that you are walking in truth. But Jesus had an interesting way of getting joy emphasized to his disciples. And you remember the story. He sent the disciples out. He put them out in pairs and he said, go. I'm going to give you authority over demons. I'm going to give you power to perform miracles. And you're going to have the power to preach. And people are going to respond. Now, there'll be rejection, but they're going to respond. And he sent them out. And then he gathered them together. And they came back. On, I mean, they were as high as you could be in joy. Because they had so much success. They were amazed at the power that Christ imparted to them. And they watched all these neat things happen. And then Jesus used that to point out something in Luke chapter 10 and verse 20. He pointed out something about a joy he wanted them to have. And it was to be a joy that was greater than success and accomplishments and victories. He said in Luke 10 verse 20, do not rejoice that the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice that your names are recorded, are recorded in heaven. You know what needs to be our greatest joy? Our future is set. We know where we're going. And we know our name is written in the Lamb's book of life because we've come to Christ in salvation. And we have the evidence to show that it's genuine. My friends, that kind of a grandparent and a parent who has that kind of a heart for the things of the Lord, they will want to share that with their grandkids. So I suggest that you express a joy. One of the little practical ways to connect with your grandkids is to express the joy that you have knowing your name's recorded in heaven. Express to them the joy that you came to Christ. Express to them the joy that you've been forgiven of your sins. So, what is the first point in your notes? Here it is. First, watch one. First generation. If it's four generation, watch one. And who is to watch? Who is it you're supposed to watch? Yourself. Give heed to yourself. So, watch one. So if you want to be an effective parent, want to be an effective grandparent, watch one. You be concerned about the condition of your own soul. Does that make sense? Keep you to yourself. Keep your soul diligently. So that you do not forget the things your eyes have seen and just not depart from your heart all the days of your life. Watch one. Second. Second. Teach. Two. How do you reach four generations for Christ? Now we're talking within your family. Teach two. Teach two. Now when you say teach, there's something that's important for you to do. It's called speak. It requires you talking. And by the way, I have fun over the years. Uh, um, I've said over the years, I have longevity in the same church uh, because I take criticism well. Now, what you need to understand is I'm basically deaf. So you use my deaf ear for criticism. And it's given me the ability to handle <laughs> ministry. Well, the point is, here's the point, talking. And then it says, and let this register deep in your soul. And it's a statement I've given you. A silent grandparent is a spiritually neutralized grandparent. You get that? If you don't talk, if you don't speak of things of the Lord, you are not fulfilling your biblical mandate. So the parents and grandparents, I encourage you to start early with your grandchildren. And here's another practical thing. It's found in Matthew 16. 
and it's verse 26, a well-known statement. But I, I have this perspective. I believe it is one of the finest things a grandparent can say, because you say it sometimes as a grandparent, we can get away saying some things that a parent maybe would be stepping in on the kids' toes a little hard, but a grandparent can say it. But here's what it is. It's using Matthew, or excuse me, Luke 20, uh, 16. Luke, uh, it's Matthew. Matthew 16, verse 26. What will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? Now here's what I do with this verse. I've said to my grandkids, the older ones, and by the way, our grandkids range in age from 4 uh, to 17. So with the older ones, we, we have both said to them, if you gain the whole world, if you accomplish everything you've ever wanted to accomplish, if you excel in sports or academics or the arts or whatever, but forfeit your soul. That's a great danger. Using it, what does it profit you to gain what everything this world has? and miss the things of your soul. You get that? How good it is to state that to your grandkids. To say, I'll always, always cheer you on whenever you succeed. As a matter of fact, there's a phrase that Linda and I use all the time. We say to the grandkids, we're cheering you on in whatever you do and wherever you go. We're cheering you on. But we also say, but what we want most for you, our biggest dream, and say, you would love Jesus with all of your heart. But grandparents, here's what's happened. We have bought what the culture says. And the culture says, parents are the ones that they're supposed to be talking to their kids. You be quiet. Let your kids, do you raise your kids? Let your kids raise your grandkids. Stay out of the world of spiritual things. And my friends, that's what the culture's promoted. But you learn in the key passage. And the key passage is what's the text? Deuteronomy what? Four, nine. Four, nine. Four, nine. Make these things known to your children and your grandchildren. Speak of them. You must Talk about them. So again, a sign of grandparent is spiritually a neutralized grandparent. But here, here's something that I got from Charles Spurgeon. He asked the question, what's so important about the soul? Because, my friends, we are speaking to our grandkids. And parents, you're speaking to your children about the things of the soul. Yes, there's a whole bunch of other things you need to talk to them about. But what's so important about the soul? Well, here's what Spurgeon said. I kind of modified it slightly. Here you see it in your notes. First, the soul exists for eternity. It exists for eternity. That's why when you talk to your kids, you know, your health is important to me. Your happiness is important to me. Your accomplishments will be something I cheer you on. But those things won't last. Your soul exists for eternity. Matthew Henry said this, When a child is born, a candle is lighted that must burn to eternity, either in heaven or hell. Wow. So first of all, the soul exists for eternity. Second, Every day, Jesus is seeking for the souls of grandchildren. He has come to seek and to save that which is lost, Luke 19. But here's a sobering number three. Every day, Satan is seeking the souls of grandchildren. 
And he is going to have people speaking into their lives. Lies. Deception. And so as grandparents. What's so important about the soul that exists for eternity? Jesus is seeking for souls, but the devil is seeking for souls as well. It says in Scripture, 1 Peter 5, your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. And my friends, he wants the souls of our children and our grandchildren. Well, since, since the soul is the is eternal and every day Jesus is seeking souls and hell's hell craves souls the souls of our children should be invaluable to us and our high priority in reaching so now I am going to introduce you to something you're also going to be held responsible for on a test okay Pastor Greg you get to ask him this afterwards okay there are three key words for you Three key words, and I implore you to make them your own. Here they are. First word, intentional, Christian, grandparents, or if you're a parent, intentional, Christian, parents. Do you see that word intentional? That's the most important word. If you're a Christian, obviously you're a Christian parent or a Christian grandparent. But putting that word intentional there means, okay, I need to be involved in talking about the Lord to my kids. So intentional Christian grandparents talk to their children, their grandchildren, about the things of the Lord. Turn to Psalm 78. Here's what's very interesting about Psalm 78. Psalm 78 is God saying, remember I told you back in Deuteronomy 4 and 9 to make these things known? Let me give you the, the history of how you did with that. And he and says in Psalm 78, he basically says, your grade is an F. You have failed. You have failed. But you pick up in verse 4, we read, We will not conceal them from their children, but tell the generation to come the praises of the Lord and His strength and His wondrous works that He has done. For He established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel, which He commanded our fathers that they should teach them to their children that the generation to come might know, even the children yet to be born, that they may arise and tell them to their children, that they should put their confidence in God and not forget the works of God, but keep His commandments. And so here's what he says. Here's what I said. Teach your children. And then teach your children to teach their children while you teach their children. And so you're to have a, a two generations. And then he says to be teaching because you see there are those that are still unborn, but will be. So you be thinking of the generation to come. Those who have not yet been born. And, and so here he says, okay, this is what I commanded you. But then he says in verse 8. Do not be like their fathers, a stubborn and rebellious generation, a generation that did not prepare its heart and whose spirit was not faithful to God. So here's what Psalm 78 says. Here's what you were supposed to do. You were to pass your faith on to your children and grandchildren. But you blew it. You stopped. And we won't have time to go through this chapter because basically he says, okay, now I want to give you the history of your failures. What happened? Because you forsook me. Because you abandoned me. Ephraim, your mightiest warriors, turned their back in the battle. They lost their confidence. And then he goes through and he just lists all the things that have gone wrong. And let me just say to you, my friends, 
one of the things that I've observed in the church is too many young people leaving the faith after high school. Is it possible that one of the common denominators is that grandparents became cultural grandparents and stopped talking about the things of the Lord to their grandkids? I don't put all the blame there, but I do believe this. I believe in this movement of grandparents becoming intentional Christian grandparents. God may use it to bring about a revival in our land. There are an estimated 30 million Christian grandparents in the USA alone. And for every grandparent, they say the average amount of grandchildren is four. So, if you have 30 million Christian grandparents who become intentional, they know on the average that of four, that's 120 million children that could be influenced by a grandparent stepping up. Who knows what the Lord might do with that? What an incredible thing. And so, again, I take you to how then, how then does the church and how does a family pass on the faith? Starts with the first one, watch one, that's you. Second, teach two, who are the two. Make them known to your children and your grandchildren. There's generation two and three. Okay? Here's the third point. Think. See that in your notes? Think for. In other words, if you have children, you should already be thinking for generations. Even though they may be years off into the future. And here's what's interesting. If you look at Psalm 78, <clears throat> he speaks of a generation, and there are four generations in view. Now, Usually, a, a generation in the Bible is 40 years. 40 years. So what he's saying is, think 160 years. Four times 40. Is that right? That's not right. Okay. The point is, think of the future. And here's what I find in so many Christians, they're in a survival mode. Not in the vision mode of how can I pass on my faith. Start with me, but reach generations for Christ. So, here's the statement in your notes. Psalm 78 encourages us to live for a time we will not see. But here's what's the kind of a fun thing too. We've already started telling our little grandkids we're not going to meet, probably not going to meet your grandkids until glory. So you be faithful, get the word down to them, so we can meet them in heaven. So, you see, God wants you to share your stories, your experience. And by the way, in Psalm 78, he says, speak of his deeds and his might and his wonders. He says, commend his work, declare his mighty acts, speak of the might of God's awesome deeds, declare God's greatness, pour forth God's fame, sing aloud of God's righteousness. Now that's kind of an intimidating list of things to do, but that's what God says, tell your family. And by the way, we cannot say, if we just do this, all of our kids will come to faith. All of our grandkids will come to faith. Because one of the heartbreaks is, this is the mystery. Or sometimes our own children have walked away from the Lord. And their grandchildren, your grandchildren, are not getting the gospel. And one of the sad things is we're finding so many grandparents that we make contact with saying, 
and my kids are restricting me from talking to my grandkids about the Lord. What a heartbreak. And then you add to that grandparents <laughs> whose kids have given up responsibility raising their kids and grandparents are raising their grandchildren. They need special help. So these are dynamics I do not want to I don't want to lay guilt on, on a grandparent who has those kind of dynamics. We do want to help you, though. But that's why I say to you, we just have to make sure we fulfill the first part. And that is this. We are agents for God. But I want you to keep in mind, first, grandparents are to make Jesus Christ clear to their children, grandchildren. Okay, your job is to simply be accurate with the truth. Amen? Speaking to them in the power of the Holy Spirit. But understand this. Only the Holy Spirit can make the Lord Jesus dear to them. You get that? Clear and dear. And by the way, here's something. Uh, I, we took sign language and uh, I always try to tell people there's a couple signs you need to understand in the church. And it's, it's the sign for amen. This is amen. 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 So I will often say, Amen? Amen. No. Oh, we don't say that. Amen. <laughs> I, one, one dear lady, she, she was so excited. She got this. She goes, I get it. It's Amen. I go, no, 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 no. This way. This way. Amen. Amen. These are the things that God wants us to understand. Make it easy. Now, I just remind you quickly the history of, of Israel. Judges 2 is the sad commentary of the failures of the things we're talking about today. In Judges 2, we get a history of what happened after Joshua died. All that generation were gathered, also were gathered to their fathers, and there arose another generation after them who did not know the Lord, nor yet the work which he had done for Israel. They forsook the Lord. We've got to see that pattern stop. Why can't, why can't that pattern stop in the church? And by the way, that's kind of happening. Parents have stopped. Grandparents have stopped. And we want to have it renewed. Let me give you some statistics that I think in part is because parents and grandparents have not been as engaged in their duties as they should. Statistics of youth leaving the church. Only 10% of families have any substantive spiritual conversations away from the church. Christian parents. Second, less than 50% of children raised in church embrace the gospel. 90% of those who walk away had a weak faith experience in their home. The National Survey of Protestant Congregations taken by the Search Institute identified parents and grandparents as the two most influential factors in a child putting their faith in Christ. So if you remove that, many children walk away from the Lord. So, hey, I need to move to it. Let's review. First generation, responsibility, watch, one. Second, teach. Two, three. Did I give you three? three. I've got to give you three. If I'm going to go to four, here we go. Think four. I did. Okay. Think four. But now, fourth, bless all. Bless all. One of the things when Linda and I heard Larry Fowler, the first thing was, where do we start? How do we start being intentional Christian grandparents? And Larry said this, learn to give your children and grandchildren the blessings from Scripture. Now watch this. Prayer, prayer, is talking to God about our needs. It's a vertical up, okay? A blessing is taking God's truth and blessing 
It's taking God's truth and giving it to others. So, here's the text. I think I wrote it down for you. Now, verse 6, 24 through 26. The familiar Levitical blessing. We then memorized it, and we started giving it to our even our youngest grandkids. But all of them hear this all the time. Here it is. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance on you and give you peace. And so when we do FaceTime or Zoom with the kids far away, we look at their faces and we say, now let's don't bow your head, don't close your eyes, look at us. We want to give you the blessing from God. And you know, it's so fun as they say, hmm, now we want to do it back. Can we give it back to you? And it's like, yes, yes, that's fine. Start by blessing it. Start by inputting in their lives what God wants. He wants to bless them. He wants to keep them. He wants to make His face shine on them. He wants to be gracious to them. He wants to give them peace. That's the place to start. So their next assignment is they got to memorize number 6, 24 through 26. Okay. Bless all. All right. Okay. Now I want to give you some things to kind of wrap these things up. The reality of it is, most grandparents are missing important opportunities to pass on their faith to the grandchildren. And my new passion, our new, our heart, and Legacy Coalition helps grandparents, helps grandparents to be intentional grand grandparents through resources and through events. And I'll give you some real quick. You won't be able to. Books. We have books on the back table. Look them over. Second, we have what's called Grand Monday Nights. If you're a grandparent, we have a free webinar at 5 p.m. weekly. And for one hour, you hear somebody who's some, somewhat of an expert on how to be an intentional Christian grandparent. All you have to do is go on our website. Scroll down to Legacy's uh, grand, grand Monday Nights, click on it, give them your email just, they will send you the link. That's huge. This is what God is using to expand our ministry right now. Uh, third, we have a national conference. The Re Legacy Coalition is the only ministry that has a national conference for Christian grandparents. It's coming up October 22 and 23 in, in Birmingham, Alabama. And I think many of you are saying, oh, that's great, that's too far. The good news is, there are like 40 simulcast sites where you can be a part of this two-day seminar. Trinity Community Church in Clovis is going to host it on Friday and Saturday. And you can be a part of it. One of the best things for intentional Christian grandparents is to hear the best of the best in speakers of intentional Christian grandparents. We just started podcasts. And you can listen to Chuck Swindoll and several others and listen to podcasts on intentional Christian grandparents. We want to get the DNA of biblical grandparenting, intentional Christian grandparenting in the church, and then uh, other resources for you, prayer cards and calendars, just to encourage you to pray. Okay, I'm going to wrap up with this. You remember what Joshua said at the end of his days. Joshua said to the people, Choose for yourselves today whom you will serve. Whether the gods which your fathers served, which were beyond the river, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. But as for me in my house, what? We will serve the Lord. My call to you is to be intentional, either a parent or preparation for that time when you become a parent, or grandparents to be intentional. Now I'm going to read this and wrap up with this. Larry Fowler drafted this, and it's like, it hits it hard. He called it the Intentional Christian Grandparent Declaration. Okay, get your seatbelts on. It's just going to take a few minutes to read it. I am a grandparent, and this is my declaration. Yes, I am a grandparent, but I am more than a grandparent. I am a Christian grandparent. I believe the Bible and the God of the Bible. 
I've received the grace of the gospel of the Christ of the Bible, and I desire to be a lifelong devoted disciple. I want my grandchildren to do the same. Yes, I am a Christian grandparent, but I am more than that. I am an intentional Christian grandparent, and this is my declaration. I love my grandkids, so I, I will hold them when they're born. I will cuddle them when they are one, chase them when they are two, read to them when they are three, play with them when they are four, and laugh at their jokes when they are five. I'll support them, exhort them, cheer them, revere them. I'll praise them, even help raise them. I will be there for them, but that's not enough. As an intentional Christian grandparent, I will do more. I will pass on my faith, but my vision is beyond that. I will perpetuate my faith, therefore I will teach two generations, but I will not only teach two generations, but I will think four generations. I will ponder what kind of grandparent must I be so my grandchild becomes one like me then his carries on the legacy. Yes, I am an intentional Christian grandparent. Culture says, retire and go play. I say, no thanks, I'll pray. Culture says, pursue affluence. I say, I'll pursue influence. Culture says, you're old, you did your time. I say, not so, I'm in my prime. <laughs> Culture says about the young generation, you can't relate. I say, ain't true. My influence is great. I know my grandchildren need me, but for me they need godly wisdom, my Christ-like example, my faith stories, my earnest prayers, my uninterrupted time, my unconditional love, and my God-authorized blessing. So what is intentional Christian grandparenting? Let me spell it out for you. I will guide grandkids with grace. I will respect parents' roles. I will abound in my affection. I will nurture their nature. I will deal with the dilemma of distance. I will pray with passion and purpose. I will adjust my attitude in case I need to restore relationships. I will excel in my example. I will number my days. I will tell them my testimony. I will intentionally influence. I will never neglect the newest generation. And most importantly, I will give them the gospel because I am an intentional Christian grandparent. And this is my declaration. Amen. Amen. Father, thank you for this time with these dear people. Thank you for your word and your instructions to us. That we just not know you individually and leave it at that, but that we pass on our faith and be those involved, especially with our family. For your kingdom, for your glory. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Would you guys please stand? with us. Uh, we're going to sing our final song is A Mighty Fortress is Our God. And we're singing that today because it is actually the 500th anniversary of the Diet of Therms, uh, where Martin Luther, who wrote um, the song A Mighty Fortress, uh, stood before um, the council and um, refused to recant his teachings and said he was going to stand on the authority of God. Uh, so we're going to sing A Mighty Fortress, um, which he wrote. Whenever you're ready, guys.
George for that uh, beautiful picture of biblical theology of grandparenting. And uh, we have a challenge before us, right, as we go from here uh, to pass down the truth to the coming generations. Let's pray and we'll be dismissed. Father, we come before you now and Lord, we thank you that your word endures. And Lord, we thank you for the opportunity you have given every single one of us to tell the coming generations of your glory, of your greatness, and the life that's found in Jesus Christ alone. Lord, I pray that all who are here today would know you and that they would walk in the truth. And Lord, that's our hope and that's our prayer for our generation, the coming generations, is that they would walk in the truth. So help us to be faithful in passing down the good news of Jesus Christ, crucified and resurrected. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Two things real quick before you leave. If you need, if you, there's a resource out there that you would like and you are unable to pay for it, the church will pay for it for you. So let me know. Also, Wednesday night prayer group is going to be meeting 6 o'clock here on Wednesday, and we'd love to have you join us for that. Lord bless you as you go from here.